incoming transmission. You're listening to the Center Seat After Show, hosted by Brian Volk Weiss, Mary Jo Tenuto, and John Tenuto. All drive systems and plasma relays are standing by. Five, four, three, two, one. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the Center Seat After Show. This is Brian Volkweiss. I directed the show, and we also have, of course, my co-hosts, Mary Jo and John Tenuto. Um, You probably noticed by now, they literally teach Star Trek. A lot of cool stuff going on. We have our first guest ever, and we will always have guests, but this, we're starting off with a good one. We got Fred Bronson with us, and Fred Bronson actually wrote an episode of the animated series, a fantastic episode called The Counterclock Incident. And this is a good time to mention, this episode is only about the animated series, so we're very excited about that. I just want to say, full disclosure, I have a lot of metaphorical PhDs in Star Trek. The original series, Star Trek 1 through pretty much everything, including the first J.J. Abrams movie. What I don't even think I have a second grade education in is Star Trek, the animated series. So if I didn't know myself so well, right now is when I would say, this is the episode I'll be the most quiet in. But I do know myself, and if I had to guess, I'm not going to be that quiet. But full disclosure, fans everywhere, Tenudos, Bronson, this, I'm going to be learning a lot during this episode. My favorite thing about this episode, before we actually produced it, there was the the guy with the arm coming out of his chest, Jax or Ajax or something. That, oh, you got the Hallmark? I I, I got You got that? Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I got. I, you have to have collectibles from the animated show. So yes, we have the Eric's everything. It's uh, would they never made an Eric's at pure action figure? So I'm still waiting for someone to make a full out regular. Maybe par- uh, playmates will do that. That would be awesome. I have the Hallmark ornament, and I don't know if you do, but my his middle arm falls off all the time. So like when I get back from a trip or something, that arm over 2,500 toys in this room. It is always his arm. That's the only thing that's fallen over anytime I'm not in this room for th- three days or more. But anyway, Fred, yeah. you, you wrote this episode. You've written six books. Oh my God, that's a lot of books, man. Tell us a little bit about yourself, please. Well, I knew I wanted to write when I was five years old and then Star Trek came along and I wanted to write for Star Trek but I was 17 years old when it went on the air and didn't know anybody, didn't have any contacts. And even though I did write a script for a college class for the original series, I didn't know where to send it or what to do with it. And then uh, the animated series came. Well, of course, when Star Trek went off the air, the original series, I thought, well, that's it. Um, There will never be another Star Trek ever. And I'm not going to write for it. And then the animated series came along and I happened to be working at NBC and they knew of what, how I felt about Star Trek. So of course I became the publicist for the animated series. And uh, the first season I didn't try to write for it, but when season two came along, I thought, okay, when this is over, this is the last Star Trek ever. There will never be any more Star Trek. And if I'm gonna write for it, this is my only opportunity. There was a little problem because I worked at NBC. I was not allowed to write for NBC shows. So I had it submitted. Filmation knew I was writing it, but I couldn't let anyone in NBC know. So I had to come up with another name. And then it actually got made. It got produced. It was on the air. I but but John, hold, hold on a second. Yeah. I've been in this business a while. It, so... To me, your story is awesome, but here's, I think you may have missed a cool part of the story. Okay. 
how does the publicist convince the executive producers, hey, let me write? Because I'm sure their reaction was, wait a minute, I thought you were a fucking publicist. Funny enough, they didn't react that way. Uh, so by the, by the time season two, I, I, I treated the animated series in terms of publicity like it was a primetime series. I gave it tons of attention, probably more than any animated Saturday morning show ever had. To me, it was the second coming of Star Trek, and it was a big deal. And so I, I said interviews, you know, for Gene with press all over the country. And, and I was really active. And I would go to Filmation maybe once a week and hang out with Lou Scheimer and Norm Prescott, who ran the company. And I knew all those people really well, and they knew me really well. So by the time I said, you know, I'd like to write an episode, they were receptive. Now, if they didn't like it, you know, then they weren't going to do me any favors. No, no one's going to do anyone a favor and produce a show if it isn't any good. So I did submit a story, and uh, NBC turned it down. They thought it was too adult, even though adults were watching. And it involved World War II being replicated on the planet, and they said, eh, we don't want to do World War II for kids. So I thought, well, now at this point, there was one slot left. They had five scripts for six episodes. And I thought, it's now or never. So I came up with the idea for the counterclock incident. I submitted it to Lou and Norm, and they gave me the go ahead to write the script. NBC approved it, not knowing it was really me. And it got produced. So they were, they were open to it. They knew me pretty well by that point. And Fred, before we go to Tenudos, I got to ask you, because if I heard you correctly, sounds like uh, you may have been neg neglecting some other shows on NBC that year. Like, uh, did, no, uh, no, had, no. did they all bomb? Did any of them get second seasons if you're hanging out with Gene Roddenberry every day? Well, I'll tell you what I did work on, and you can decide for yourself. I was a uh, publicist on Sanford and Son. Uh, the last season of Bonanza, which I don't think that was my fault. It was last my... season, Fred. You yeah. said it yourself, last season. I know, I know. I killed Bonanza. Okay, you can put it on me. Uh, so, no, the truth is there were about 12 publicists in the department. And between us, we handled every daytime show, every primetime show, every late night show, every series, every movie. Anything that was going to air on the network had a publicist. So we all had maybe five or six shows at a time. And uh, by, by the time the animated series came along, I was just used to balancing that. So, Fred, I, I will, and I'm sorry to do this to you with microphones recording, but I, I did meet Lauren Green once. And lo the first thing Lauren Green said to me, if it wasn't for the counterclock incident, we may have had a 13th season. So okay. I, okay. I, I'm sorry um, to have to do this to you publicly. Do you want my best Lauren Green story? Of course. Is the Pope the Catholic? Well, it's the first episode of the last season. We didn't know it was the last season at the time. We're on location in Sonora, California. There's a reporter from a local paper who wants to come over and interview Lauren. We're talking the 14th season of Bonanza. It was the number one show in America for eight years in a row. Everybody knows Bonanza. I bring the reporter to the open field where we're shooting. I introduce him to Lauren. His first question is, so what part do you play on the show? And I thought, Lauren gave me a look like, who is this guy? And then he turned to him and said, well, I play the father of three boys and I own a ranch. Lauren was a great guy. I really bad, loved him, but I've bad. never heard a question that bad in my entire career. That's, uh, so say we all. All right, Tenudos, what, how, like, what's your, I assume you know a lot more than I do about the animated series. Like, what, what was your entry point? Well, for me, that was the, that really was the entry point. I think I'm, you know, I was alive when, when Star Trek was on, but a little too young to, to appreciate it. Uh, but I was the market. I was the audience for, uh, f at least, partially the audience right because i think and fred i'm sure knows much more about this than i do but the the approach to that show was that it was going to be star trek again it was going to it wasn't really f only for kids 
it would be for kids because it's Saturday morning, but it would also be for adults and really for, for everyone. If it was a show for everyone. And uh, some things would have to be toned down because of the time slot, but not, not as much as you would get on a, on a lot of other Saturday morning shows. So for me, that was my, my introduction to it. I, I saw the animated show before I saw the original show. And so I, the Amigo toys, you know, were based on the animated show, really the designs of them, the costumes, the colorfulness of the Amigo bridge, all of that was animated show. So for me, that was my sort of my window into, into that. And I have to say, Fred, I, I, everybody's favorite episode is, is yesteryear. Of course, if you, if, cause if you don't, if you don't love yesteryear, you're kicking a puppy, right? I mean, that's the yesteryear is such a great special thing, but I, my two favorite episodes I think Mary Jo probably agrees with me, is uh, The Jihad uh, by Stephen Kendall and uh, Counter Clock Incident, which I never oh. knew, which I never knew was written by you until, okay. you know, until the making of started to come out and the DVDs and all of that. And you get sort of behind the scenes, because, of course, all I saw was John Culver, right. uh, you know, and it made me think of Culver City, which is, I that's, think, what, what maybe, where it came from. Yeah. Right? <laughs> and uh but um, I love that episode because it had Robert April in it. I mean, to me, that was just because I didn't, you know, I consider the animated show canon. Sure. Um, sure. There's too many things that have been taken from it and brought into other Star Treks for it not to be canon. Right. Um, and, and DC being, DC Fontana being behind it and all that makes it all canon yeah. to me. Yeah. And Gene, and Gene too. Gene, I understand, he was involved. He, he oh, made he story was. ideas. Yeah. I, he wrote notes on my script. You know, so yeah, he was very involved. So that was, uh, you know, I uh, such a great episode, and then to see Robert April for real, and not just be a name in in the world of Star Trek book, you know, and 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 in the which, which is where I got the name. <laughs> I went to that list and said, well, I might as well take a name Gene already loves, and you know, and also I had to check and make sure that they never referred to Pike as the first captain, and they didn't. I watched, you know, the, the menagerie all over again. So I thought, well, who's to say there wasn't a predecessor to Pike? And that's where I came up with Robert April. Little realizing, you know, I'd be seeing his name on a screen in Star Trek Discovery many years later. How did you balance being a fan who, I mean, the enthusiasm of a fan with getting to meet Gene Roddenberry? You had been on the set though, hadn't you been on the original oh, yeah. series set? I had, a, I had a visit. Well, the first time I met Gene was during season one. I was a, a freshman in college writing for my college paper. And I said to the editor, you know, I'd really like to interview Gene Roddenberry. And they said, if you can get Gene Roddenberry, we'll run it. I called, I got an appointment. I went over and interviewed him. Uh, and that was a one-off at that, at that time. I mean, I didn't, it, we didn't become friends out of a, a college interview, uh, but that happened later. But yeah, meeting Gene Roddenberry. Uh, so all I remember is I'm sitting in the outer office waiting to go in to see Gene and this jackhammer went off outside and then I realized it was not a jackhammer and I'm not exaggerating it was my heart oh my I, god you've heard the phrase how your heart pounds wow the only time in my life wow. that I felt and heard my heart pound wow. the idea that I was going to be going in and sitting down and talking to Gene was probably the most exciting thing that had happened to me in my life up to that point. So it was a big, a big deal. Then I ended up working at NBC and he did a pilot called Questor and I was the publicist for that. So that's when I really got to know him. And then the animated series. And then we were friends uh, until the day he died, literally. And Mary Jo, tell us, you know, what was your intro uh, to the animated series? Well, John got me into Star Trek. And I watched all the original series and then I was hooked. So I wanted to consume as much as possible. And I watched all the animated uh, episodes and I loved the color. I know if I had watched them um, when they premiered as a kid, I would have loved all those bright colors, the purple, green, pink. And it's, I think it's fitting that the animated show has such vibrant colors because the original series was used to sell color TVs. That was one of the first shows and that really sold people on you know, why switch from, you have a perfectly good black and white TV, why buy a color TV, right? So you can see the bright colors on 
the original series. So I think you could add that to the column when you were making the list of, is it canon, is it not canon? Well, you could put the animated show into canon because with the bright colors, it's just like the original series. It fits. Um, Fred, I, I wanna ask you something. We, we were talking about this uh, last week on the first episode. Uh, you having met Jean, you being a writer, and obviously most importantly, you being a lifelong Star Trek fan. Right. Um, I noticed, I mean, I think I've read almost every book about the making of Star Trek. And I think I've read, I've watched almost every documentary about the making of Star Trek. One of the major differences between the books and the documentaries is that the books are very honest about the pros and cons of Gene Roddenberry as a man. Whereas when you watch the documentaries, it's always just the best thing about him. Like it never talks about anything other than him. He's the greatest guy ever, which is weird. Cause like George Lucas doesn't get that. James Cameron doesn't get that. Steve Jobs, Spike Lee, like you always get. So you met him, why is that? And what, what do you think about that? And what, like, again, cause you met him, what insight can you share with our listeners about him as a man and how he's portrayed in books versus documentaries? Oh yeah, no, I thought about this a lot. Uh, first of all, my experience of him was 100% fantastic. And I'm not exaggerating. The gene that I saw was generous. I mean, when we would go to lunch or dinner, I was not allowed to pick up the tab ever, except on his birthday. He would let me take him out on his birthday. And every year I tried to top what we did the year before. But kind, generous, supportive. When, when I first started, when I wanted to write for Next Generation, uh, he arranged for me to meet with, you know, one of the producers to pitch. Uh, and although that story didn't sell, season two, when I came up with an idea with Susan Sackett, who was his assistant, who was a friend of mine originally, and I got her the job with Gene. Uh, he was totally supportive of us, you know, writing and bought our story that didn't get made. Sure. Was he flawed? Absolutely. Uh, not in a way that ever bothered me or disturbed me. You know, he, he enjoyed women a lot. Um, there was some drug use. He drank. But was he kind and generous and a good friend? Absolutely. We never had a crossword. We never, you know. But I think the thing about why people portray him the way they do in the documentaries is who wants to tear down Gene Roddenberry? I mean, he gave us this incredible legacy that has lasted for decades. He created one of the most important, passionate things in my life and millions of other people. So why, why tear him down? But also why not show the man as he really was? Beautiful. So the, the question we all have for you, cause again, we were never there. Sure. And I, it's going to be like, I'm trying to hypnotize you or something, but, but I'm not. I I'm just not getting sleepy. It's okay. All right, good. Uh, so none of us, the listeners, the Tenudos, me, none of us were there. Right. So do me a favor. When it's your episode being made or anything like that, greenlit, go in a film, try and do this. Start, I want you to repeat this after me and then continue the sentence, okay? Okay. But I want to hear about a day or your first day, but repeat after me. Got it. I woke up and... I woke up and... All right. Well, let's start with writing the episode. Uh, like I say, there was one slot left. I had a very limited amount of time to write a script and get it to Lou and Norm before they were going to get a script from somebody else. So I wrote it really quickly. And, and Fred, I'm sorry to interrupt, but I, again, I want to just keep digging in on this. Yeah, yeah. So you would send it to Filmation. It wouldn't go to Roddenberry. Like yeah. that was the process. Yes. No, so, so see, you know, as we all know, Dorothy Fontana, was the showrunner on season one, but she wasn't there for season two. 
If Dorothy had still been there, the script would have gone to her. And frankly, I did submit ideas for season one. And recently I found uh, Dorothy's notes and she didn't like anything I submitted. That's okay, it's her privilege, that was her privilege. Uh, but so season two, with one slot left, I wrote The Counterclock Incident, really got the idea from a Philip K. Dick novel called Counterclock World and included the counterclock in the title as an homage to Philip K. Dick, my favorite author. And I sent it out. Yeah, you send to Lou and Norm. They decide if they want to, if they like it. If they do, then they submit it to NBC and send it to Gene. But that wasn't, you know, what I should do or would do as a, as a writer. And they got back to me and said, yeah, NBC loves it and we're going to do it. That's how it started. So Gene literally wrote handwritten notes on his copy of my script. And years later, I was able to see that. And, you know, the, the concept is they go into a universe where time runs backwards and everything runs in reverse. And Gene scribbled in the margin, really? How do they pee? Or, <laughs> fortunately, I didn't oh have Oh my it. God. I know. Oh my. Do you have it? Like, do you have that in your house? Uh, I don't know. I don't. I don't. It was something I was allowed to see in the files, but I never, I probably should have taken it, but I didn't, but, but I'll never, I'll never forget. Yeah. Yeah. If I did, it would have been on eBay. No, no, I'm kidding. I, it would not be on eBay, uh, but I'll never forget that, you know, and also that's how I knew he was paying attention. Dorothy was running the show, but if he didn't like something or if he wanted to change something that was going to happen. So a lot of people think that maybe he was removed from the animated series, but that's not true. He was definitely involved. Uh, so the script gets written, it goes to filmation. Now, because it's animated, you know, I'm not there. On, on my first episode for Next Generation, writers are not invited to the set, probably because they're afraid you're gonna yell, that's not what I meant. So you're not allowed to be there, especially if you're a freelance writer. Uh, but since my writing partner was Gene's assistant, he gave us permission to be on the set every day. So for seven days, we were on the set of Menage à Troy. There's no set to be on for the animated series. However, there was a broadcast standards person assigned to the show from NBC. And he and I would go to filmation every week or every time a new episode was ready and watch before it aired, literally on a movieola. And for those people too young to know what a moviola is, you're looking at it on a tiny little screen. That's how I first saw the counterclock incident. And I got to tell you, you know, my first writing for Star Trek to hear Shatner and Nimoy saying my words, that was the best moment of my life up until that moment. I'm just curious, how fast did you have to write that? Because I know you said you had, there was only one slot left. So I was just curious, right. was it like, are you talking like, in a week, overnight? I'm talking in about three days. Wow. Now, that was my own deadline because I knew there was one slot left. Nobody said to me, hey, if we don't get a story in a week, we're gonna go with something else. Nobody ever said that to me. And I have no idea if they had other submissions. I just knew that if I didn't hurry, it was gonna be too late. So I wrote it in three days, got it off to Lou and Norm and heard back pretty quickly. And I think it's important to note too that uh, that is the last episode of the animated show. So Fred wrote the series finale really without without the conceptualization of what that would you know that it was the, necessarily the last, but it was. Right. There's only six series finales of Star Trek, and for and for us as fans, those words that were spoken in that episode were the last time Shatner, Nimoy, uh, you know, uh, everyone would. Uh, speak their words as their TV characters all together uh, in that last episode. And that was a great episode because they really were kind of all, you know, some of the episodes they had, you know, they've had episodes where there's no Kirk, right? They had the, the slaver weapon has no Kirk in it. Uh, that one really, everybody gets a chance to be themselves and their younger selves in that episode. Um, their kitty versions of themselves. Uh, is, Fred, there, is there, wait, sorry, John, is there a reason, like, were they mad at Shatner that week? Like, why why isn't he that's kind of weird yeah that was larry nevin's script uh that the 
the idea was that he was actually taking a short story of his called The Soft Weapon, and he was adapting that to be what becomes the animated series episode. The alien race is pretty much the same in the book as in the animated show. And uh, he wanted to keep it as close as possible to the short story. So in the short story, you kind of have a ship, small ship with three people on it. So he just wanted to, it, it worked for Star Trek, shuttlecraft, three people. And his view was he didn't want to have it be where it would be Kirk kind of separated for in this type of a story for from the ship for so long they wanted in other words kirk can kirk can keep the enterprise going but you can have spock and and sulu and uhura kind of on their own adventure self-contained and not have to necessarily worry about where the enterprise was and he just really wanted it to be focused on the three characters i think he said he chose sulu because uh he wanted uhura because he wanted that counterbalance the female perspective the the you know uh spock because you're dealing with a, a emotional race to some degree, but you have Spock as a counterpoint to that. And that Sulu just seemed like a good fit and, a, and kind of like not have chosen at random, but out of the other people that seemed to be the, the best one to sort of pick you. You couldn't pull Kirk and McCoy wouldn't, you know, make a lot of sense for the function that he had in the story. But, but that was kind of a neat, I thought a neat episode because you don't have, I mean, it's almost like, um, you have the original series episode, the Tholian web where Kirk's kind of out of it for a lot of it. He's there, but he's, you know, he's the story. He's the story point, right? He's the, he's the, he's the Ark of the Covenant that they're going after, <laughs> whatever it happens. Uh, and, uh, but I always thought that that was a great feature of the animated show. Cause you got to see these other characters get more. I mean, Sulu was, was more developed. Uhura was certainly more developed on the animated show. Uh, but even Spock and Kirk, you get to know more about their characters and who they were and their backgrounds. And because they could do an episode that only had one or two or three people in it or whatever it happened to be. But Fred's was a great one because it kind of has every it has everyone in it. And you, you don't want to end the show on one that has, you know, because oh, the animated animation is weird, right? The one thing about animation is they do like, like our, our son, he loves a show called Wander Over Yonder. And it was a Disney show. But you know, they, they, a lot of times with animation, they only make a certain number of episodes. It's enough because they can rerun them forever. Kids don't care. They'll rewatch them over and over and over again. And so, you know, we might have a perception that like Fat Albert had a lot of episodes, but it really didn't. You know, uh, it was enough to have 22 episodes. That's, that was great. That, that had run for a, a year and they could run that at Scooby Doo is the same thing. There weren't that many Scooby Doo's really when we were kids. And so, uh, our son who likes that show, uh, Wander Over Yonder, it's an animated show, but that was kind of the thought process it was like, there's enough episodes, but the fans are like, that's not enough episodes. I want new episodes. Right. And especially with the animated show, because there were so many adult fans. Also, you know, so. by the way, the, the finale, nobody ever said wrap up the series, you know? And so I didn't. I mean, it, it's interesting because of course, all the other finales, well, not the original series, but, you know, there were some, you know, big ending or you know i i didn't have everybody playing poker and saying the sky's the limit or anything uh but yeah i was aware that it was the last episode because it was my last opportunity to to do this i was gonna say i just i actually prefer that i like that way the original series ended a lot of shows ended that way right in the past they just because sure. they were episodic they were episodic so they just ended sure. yeah. uh but i like that because then i get to determine <laughs> determine what happens to the characters i you know cisco you know i don't, I don't want cisco to not die or sort of die or kind of die, but not really die. Um, uh, no matter how beautiful that ending is, uh, it's a beautiful ending, but it's, sure. you know, it's sort of nice to know that they're going off on adventures and, 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 and they're still going on the adventure. Oh, I totally agree. Yeah. I got to ask. Well, first of all, John, do we ever know how Mr. Shatner felt about not being in an episode? Has that ever been made public? No, I think, I, I, did you, you know, you never heard it. Do you ever hear anything about that? Well, it was a filmation book. Yeah. Shatner and Nimoy would count their lines. And if one had more lines than the other, filmation heard about it. So, yeah. So Lou Scheimer has a book that he wrote about the history of filmation and he talks about it, but he, he talks about Shatner was very enthusiastic about doing the, the animated show. There's a quote from Shatner 
he it kind of it's it, it was like slipping back into an old overcoat or some kind of you know like an old sweater it was he had not done the role for four years really and and now he was stepping back in and he did it and that it gave him a chance to do really a form that he hadn't done much before since rate well i shouldn't say ever done, but he had been in radio and but he hadn't done that for many years he had moved on to tell stage and television and and film and so on and so it was kind of a way for him to get back to his roots. So Jimmy Dewan was a radio person. I mean, a lot of the Star Trek actors would have started off doing some, some radio, particularly Jimmy and, and, and uh, William Shatner did that. So that was a chance for them to kind of come back and do something that was similar uh, to that. Um, and he had actually worked with Fomation before Shatner. He did a show called The Heroes, which was a live action interview show. I, I it may have been Bill's first interview show since he, I mean, he's, ex, he's great at interviewing. Uh, you know, we loved raw nerve and things like that, that he had done. Um, but it, he got to interview real life heroes, heroes from different areas of society. And some were actors, some were astronauts and athletes. And the show didn't last too long, but it was sort of like a Saturday morning filmation, but live action with Shatner introducing these, these people to the, to the kids. Uh, my favorite episode uh, cause I'm probably, you know, one of the few people that actually remembers him, uh, was with Greg Morris, uh, because it was him and Greg Morris together, which was kind of neat. Cause Greg Morris always has that tangential relationship to Star Trek through his son, Phil Morris, who was in literally every version of Star Trek. He was, you know, one of the little kids in the original show. And he was the, 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 the young cadet in Star Trek three, who asks if they're going to have a party when they get back and a hero is welcome. And we and, paid for the party with our dearest blood yeah. yes that's so that's how, that's a how greg morris's son I, and i swear to you john i use that in a regular conversation 48 hours ago <laughs> yeah it comes up every day right so you, you feeling bad for my wife yet <laughs> it's tough to work in i'm glad you got that <laughs> got to work then in the conversation <laughs> but uh yeah so that oh, it, wait it, but john you kind of interrupted yourself so you were like they counted their lines so was he pissed being cut out of a whole episode? Not we are, we don't have any. There's nothing where we hear we hear about that at all. He doesn't seem to be that way. Part of it was maybe just because the actors really weren't there. I mean, they were they were in, physically in some sort of studio with one another. It wouldn't have been like a live action show where you knew you weren't on that episode because you come in and where's my part? What am I doing? You know that I think that they only filmed. Three episodes, is that right, Mary Jo? Three. Three, three as an ensemble. Uh, together with one another. The first three were done where they were all together. Uh, I think it was, was it yesteryear? Yes. Beyond uh, the yesteryear. Fire of the Star. And, and, um, and uh, well, gosh, what was the third right episode? Then. Oh, I have it. I have it in my notes. Um, like, but I mean, if these two dudes are counting lines, you don't think Shatner noticed, like if there were supposed to be 25 episodes, he was only going into work 24 times. But I think he did a lot of recording, didn't he? He did his recording like on the go. He, he I mean, I, I, he did his recording like where he was at. Yeah. So they would send him what he needed to say. He would say those lines wherever he was at. He, I, he talks about how he did a lot of the recordings in bathrooms because of the acoustics, you know, not because he was <laughs> doing something, but the acoustics in the bathroom were good, but he, he would be on the road. He'd be doing a stage play or a movie or something like that. And so it's possible. I mean, I've never heard him say anything about not being in the episode, but, but it's possible he may not have realized he wasn't in that episode I because. Think likely, yeah. I don't Do you think, think it's possible he's listening to this podcast right now? Yes. And he's just learning. He got cut out of an episode. Is that possible, Fred? No, so pissed off. <laughs> By the way, we got a lot of bathroom jokes in this episode. I like it. We do. We do. It's That's a, number three. It's a running theme. Fred, again, same question. Yeah. None of, well, actually, what the fuck am I talking about? I did meet DC Fontana, but let's, let's pretend I didn't, okay? okay? Okay. But you know what? I met her five years ago, so... She, she wasn't exactly running a show five years ago. Sure. You knew her in her prime twice. I did. What's she like? Dorothy, uh, a little complicated, I would say. Uh, sometimes I felt like I was her best friend and sometimes I felt like I wasn't there. So uh, it was- it was. But, but was Fred, Fred, let me ask you, I'm sorry to interrupt, but let me ask you something. Go ahead. Go ahead. 
Here's this woman running a show. Right. And she's got the publicist saying in her ear every minute, hey, can I write a script? Can I write a script? Oh, I never said that to her. Okay, all right. I submitted, I did submit some ideas for the first season. That's true. But I was not bugging her. I was not, I, I wasn't like that. So, and once, you know, they didn't buy anything from me and that was that. But I had known her, I had known her previously. I had met her and uh, I liked her. I liked Dorothy and I admired her and respected her. And, you know, again, like meeting Jean that first time, the first time I met DC Fontana was absolutely amazing because I watched those credits every week. But I got to know her as a human being. And most of the time, I thought she was great. And sometimes she'd be a little difficult or her attention was elsewhere. She's a human being. Speaking of human beings, let's get back to you, Fred. So <laughs> again, I, I've been in the business a little while, a couple years, if <laughs> years means decades, because right. I'm getting old. But let me ask you this. So listening to what you're saying, yeah, it sounds like in addition to being a great writer, and I'll give you the benefit of the doubt, even though you got Bonanza canceled, uh, you were a great publicist. <laughs> okay. You sound like you're an operator. And I mean that as a compliment, because this is what I'm hearing. You're like, Dad, my writing partner. Oh, happened to be Gene Roddenberry's assistant. Oh, I'm, uh, you know, getting, I'm taking Gene out to lunch all the time. So, Talk about that, because I think a lot of people think about Hollywood. It's all about the talent. And I'm not taking away from your talent. No, but I'm, I'm, can you talk a bit about the periphery to talent? Ooh, that sounded fancy. I like that. We're it's gonna, a $5 oh, college word. Actually, from, that's my next, my next episode is called Periphery to Talent. You're stealing my <laughs> joke, Fred. You're stealing my joke. Uh, but I, I just got that compliment from a real professor. That's, I'm, right. I'm very proud of myself. I should quit right now. <laughs> but Fred, can you talk about, because again, I've read a bunch of your books, six books, everybody, six yeah. books, read them all, buy them all. <laughs> but Fred, you talk a lot about the creative. You talk a lot about the, you know, Gene was like this, Nimoy was like that. Right. Talk a bit about yourself and the non-creative stuff you did sure. to accomplish what you did. Well, here's my take on it. I've met a lot of people in my life, a lot through my publicity work at NBC, just a lot in my career. Everything in my eyes happened organically. It wasn't like a plot or a plan. And if it were, I'd tell you. I mean, i I you know, I have no problem saying that. But well, you already told us you lied to NBC. So yeah. we trust you. I have. By the way, did you ever get caught? No. Nice. A almost. And I'll tell you really quickly how I almost got caught. So I was not a morning person. I did not wake up early. But the day that my episode was airing, I knew that if I went over to my office at NBC, I could watch the East Coast feed but we're talking like at six or 6.30 in the morning. I also knew that no one's in the office on Saturday, so no problem. So I went to the office, I watched my episode at 6.30 a.m. and my boss walked in and he said, oh, hey, he said, hey, well, why are you here on Saturday? He said, oh, you know, Star Trek's on. I just thought I'd catch the East Coast feed. I never said why. That's as close as I came to being caught. But and I even couldn't. after your boss retired or you retired, you never were like, hey, no, want to no, hear something I, funny? After I left NBC, then I had no qualms about they couldn't fire me anymore. I don't know that I would have been fired, but that was certainly a possibility. I wasn't going to even take a chance on losing my job. So, yeah, uh, I was very vocal and open about it once, once I was no I was there for 12 years. I left in 1982. Then I opened my big mouth about it. Uh, but as far as your, your original question, I've been very lucky. I mean, you know, uh, the way I met Jean, sure, the college interview, but then through work. And I didn't know we were going to be friends. It just developed gradually, day by day and week by week. The fact that I 
sent Susan Sackett to him, you know, and she became his assistant. But I didn't do it to get to know him better, but it facilitated going to the office and going to lunch maybe every two weeks. And it just happened. So I'm very lucky it happened, but I can't say that I plotted it all out. And if I do this, this will happen. Well, is e either way, very, very, uh, very impressive. Well, I know I won't, I won't shine a spotlight on the fact that you uh, put one of the most important people in all of Star Trek into Gene's life. I will, I'll, I'll, I'll let you gloss over that, but that, okay. uh, that, that sounds quite impressive. That sounds very well, impressive. I mean, it's like at the time, who knew? I just knew Susan was out of work. Gene's secretary at, at the time didn't want to continue with him because he worked at Warner Brothers. Gene was leaving a lot and the guy didn't want to lose his seniority. So he needed somebody new. And I sent Susan over and she got the job. It just, you know, if I had plotted it, I couldn't have plotted it any better. I, yeah, I was thinking that. So I'm glad you said it. You bring up a great point, And I actually think you're not even going to believe this. We have a clip that will sync up with the point you made. And I didn't plot that. Gene had his own concerns, not wanting to see his sophisticated sci-fi creation reduced to child's play. Gene really just was not interested in a kiddie version of Star Trek. But desperate to keep the franchise alive, he agreed to an animated series. The only thing that convinced him was the idea we will do real Star Trek as an animated series. To guarantee that, Gene brought in one of the original series' most respected writers to run the show. Dorothy Fontana came aboard as the producer. She was the guiding force. She was the one that really wanted this to be wonderful. Dorothy, or DC Fontana, was a very talented screenwriter, but as a woman, she could not yet afford to trade on her name. In those days, it wasn't common for a woman to be a scriptwriter. Women were hiding behind their initials, V.N. McIntyre and C.L. Moore and D.C. Fontana, because there was this belief that women couldn't write. So, Fred, you know, it's weird. I'm reading this great comic book because John recommended it to me, year five. And it's it's funny. I it's It's, you know, I look at the cover and it's, you know, it's, five dudes and either one woman or two women if they put chapel in there like but when you were there it was actually the opposite right it was kind of like unusual that there were women there at all is is that accurate it's very accurate i mean just as I, as i was listening to that clip i was thinking about all the shows i worked on they were totally male dominated i don't remember especially by 1973 I don't remember any, no, there probably were, but I don't remember working with any female producers or directors and frankly, not many writers either. It was a different time and not in a good way. So yeah, things have changed a lot, but I felt, you know, that Dorothy had, now I, it would be interesting if we could talk to her now, which we can't. Uh, what her experience was of being a woman around 1973, 74, working in the industry. But my, what I saw was she had everyone's total respect and she had the authority and she was, you know, she was DC Fontana. But yeah, it was a different time in terms of women working in the industry. I, I love your point of view on this, uh, Mary Jo. She was the youngest uh, story editor in Hollywood at the time at 27. And she was one of the few women, I don't have an exact number, but she was, yes, one of the few women um, story editors, um, story writers. And then she went on to teach uh, TV and film writing at the American Film Institute. And there's actually a band named after her. It's a punk band. It's called DC Fontana. And she found that, um, you know, she was honored that they named themselves after her. And in Lou Scheimer's book, he describes her as an angel. Ooh, okay. All right. Well, that's, um, that's great. I'm glad, uh, I'm glad we paid that clip. Um, John, is there anything, I, again, I feel like I'm hogging the microphone. Is there anything, you know, here's Fred. I 
I don't think you know each other. Maybe you're best friends and I didn't read an email. I've never met before. Is, is there anything you want to ask? Uh, like, and you too, Mary Jo, I didn't mean to single out John here, but is there anything you want to ask him? Again, he was there, we weren't. What do you want to know? Well, gosh, uh, so much. I, I also want to know about Next Gen, but that'll have to be another show because uh, for fans who may not know, Fred also did the story for the game, uh, which is really the in many ways, one of the first sort of TV, it was a prescient. There's a, there's a word for you, Brian, to impress you. Uh, it's a $6 <laughs> word. <laughs> uh, By the way, I got to say, in my top 10 favorite episodes, and this is real respect, Fred, I think one of two episodes, my wife made it through. Oh, wow. Well, thank her for me. Yeah, she's not a fan. She's no Mary Jo Tenuto. Anyway, you were saying, John. So, yeah, I was just, you know, that's such a great episode because it's like predicting in a way what social media and screen time, you know, you substitute the game for a, a, a tablet and uh, you have modern society in some ways in that episode. At the end of the episode, when yeah. they're all coming after Wesley, right? that's fucking scary. Like, I remember being a kid yeah. like creeped the fuck out so and that's not really a feeling you normally get from next gen right. so kudos to you sorry john well and and more credit to brandon braga on that because we did write susan and i wrote the story this is a long story i'll tell another time but that episode was in development for a long time and was in the dead file until rick berman said to michael pillar whatever happened to that story that Fred and Susan came in with about the game? And Pillar said, it's in the dead file. And Rick said, no, no, I like that one. We're going to do it. So that's how it, it got made. And by the way, it, the, the genesis of the episode, I got the idea for it from playing too much Tetris on my computer. Oh, wow. that's hilarious. That's awesome. <laughs> did, you, did you know that? I did not know that. That's did awesome. Not. Well, I, I did. Not. Wow. No shit. That's true. Wow. And then, of course, now when you watch it, you think Candy Crush, Pokemon, you know, there's different levels, you know, anyway, it's. Yeah, it's we just got some center seat scoop right here, right now. I'm glad you asked that question, John, but I, can't, I interrupted you. Go on. Yeah, what I know, else so, do I know? so I was wondering, did you have it? Because one of the things I love about the animated show is the music of it. And I know the music was actually done. Seems to be a lot of uh, 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 monikers, people using you know pseudonyms on the show, but it was really Ray Ellis who did the music. Right? I honestly had no oh okay I had no relationship to the music, so I didn't know. I was wondering. I was wondering if you ever had a chance to interview, like because Norm Prescott did the music along with uh, Ray Ellis. Ray Ellis was very famous. Um, he was an arranger. Did Splish Splash for Bobby Darin. Chances Are by Johnny Mercer. Mathis. Right. Yeah, for uh, I'm sorry. Yeah, Johnny Mathis. Yeah, yeah. yeah, Johnny Mathis. That's right. Thank you. Just very famous sort of jazz musician, and but yet doing music for animated shows like Fat Albert and all, and the Brady Kids and all of that. And he, he wrote as uh, his wife's name. Actually, he oh. used his wife's name on Star Trek. So were there people that you interviewed uh, who maybe worked on the show who were coming in like Mark Leonard or? Were you, were you able to kind of get to know any of the, there weren't that many guest stars necessarily on the show, but there were, the guest stars they had were either from the original show, uh, like Stanley Adams, or they were like people like Ted Knight, you know, from yeah. the Mary Tyler Moore show. So did yeah. you get a chance to interact with any of those people? I know I didn't. I, I, if, if I could go back and do it over, I would absolutely interview all of them and do press releases. I did a lot of press releases and a lot of them were, feature stories on, you know, on DeForest Kelly or Nichelle. Uh, but uh, no, I wish I had. It would have been a great thing to do. Brad, I have, yeah, Mary jo, sorry. I have two questions. Yeah. So I, I appreciate that the animated series episodes are very tight. You know, it's 22 minutes. It's one main story. Not like today where a show that's 22 minutes might have an A, B, and a C story and like they do, right? everything is so short. Yeah. Did you find that difficult to write a story in that time limit? And then I also want to know, was there anything that you had to cut out that you wish was in the episode? Well, I didn't do the cutting, but Filmation did. So 
I was trying to write, th it was really, you're supposed to write three acts of seven minutes or so each, which is where we get 22 minutes, seven something times three. Uh, and it turns out that, you know, this was the first script that really, aside from the one I wrote in college for the original series that nobody saw, this was the first script I actually wrote and submitted and got produced. And so it turns out my script was a little bit long. You know what that means, Fred? Tell it me. means you're an operator. Okay, I'm gonna deny when, it. When, when someone tries to sell one script and yeah. sells one script yeah. their first time, right? yeah, you're an operator. Anyway, okay. go on, I'll, go I'll, on. I'm gonna take it as a, as a compliment. Whatever. It is a compliment. Uh, so there a lot there was stuff cut for sure, but I didn't do it. Uh, filmation did it for for time. So there are a couple of spots in the episode where I feel like they took out a piece of dialogue, but they just kept going and it didn't really make sense. Like when April's on the bridge at the beginning, and he's talking about you know she was always like my child. It sounds like he's talking about the bridge, but they took out the part where we're talking about the Enterprise. He was saying the Enterprise is like my child. The bridge isn't like his child. That makes no sense at all. Oh, so funny. <laughs> That's so hilarious. Funny. I love that. So definitely there was stuff cut. All right. We, we, we got to start wrapping this up. But Fred, I got to ask you. Yeah. Am I an operator? No. What? what was That's a callback. Only an operator would do a callback. I'm just kidding. All right. <laughs> Have you seen Lower Decks? Every episode. And I love it. And I think Gene would love it. I love it more now than I did. I, I liked the first episode. You know, I was into it. I never felt like this is bad. Never, ever. But it's just gotten better and better and better. Created by a true fan. And, you know, they even did an Easter egg for the game. So how can I not like Lower Decks? I'm waiting for Robert April to show up. But uh, I love the fact that they tie into the original animated series. You know, another care, another being from Eric's uh, species. Uh, the you know from David Gerald's you know Bem episode, we've seen you know a character. So I love it. I love how much Star Trek it is, and how close and faithful it is to Star Trek. Fred, I totally agree with you. I love Lower Decks. What What about you, John, Mary Jo? Uh, well, you know I. I have a, uh, a, a interesting relationship with Lower Decks, uh, just as a fan. Are, are you uh, writing under a pseudonym? I am. I'm Steve Culver. <laughs> John's long lost brother. <laughs> You're Vulcan Steve. I'm Vulcan Steve from the from the uh, original pitch by uh, Filmation for Vulcan Steve. Uh, I wanted to see that. I want to see Steve so bad. That's mentioned in the center seat episode. And, and Chekhov's. Uh, and Chekhov's friend, Chris, Chris. And Sulu's friend, Stick. These are great names. And McCoy's, they're very creative Bob, name. Bob. Bob. These are I, Can I Bob. just tell you real quickly, I did name characters after friends of mine. <laughs> That's, awesome. That's yeah. awesome. Yeah. Uh, so, um, you know, there's parts of it. There's, there's who can't love all the callbacks. I mean, they're just, they're beautiful. They're, they're, they're really great. I mean, there's one episode of Lower Decks that an embarrassment of Dopplers, I think it's called, that literally has almost every alien species from the original animated show in that episode. I mean, everyone, the Kazin, everything, the Kazin are in there, everything. So I, I, I love that. Uh, it's, it gets a little complicated for me when the humor goes, not that I'm a prude, I'm certainly not a prude, but when it goes into they, there's things that they they dance awfully close to things that I don't know you you could never animation you can get away with things that you can't get away with in real life but like the first episode there really is a scene that skirts very close and this is just my opinion that skirts awfully close to like a sexual assault you got a naked man who's you know being literally assaulted she's sitting there going like enjoy it and sipping a soda or something like that and I, I, when you get into that realm, I, I, it's hard for me to go, if it was some other format or something, but with Star Trek, it's kind of like, we're usually sensitive to these kinds of things in Star Trek. We're, we're socially minded on, upon that. And if it had been a commentary about it, then I would have been like, oh, okay, they're doing a commentary, making me think, but it was more just a joke. So 
I'm, I'm trying to reconcile that with the fact that it's got beautiful animation. The inc- music. Incredible music. So like film quality that, that once in a while touches and hints at the original scores, but is its own thing and it's beautiful. Wonderful animation. And, and again, made by people who obviously love Star Trek and who want to put as much as they can for fans in there so that when you watch it, you're like, oh, yes, yes, oh, yes. And you get excited just by the, the references. And I got to say, the last episode of this second season, without spoiling it, if, that's the, if they are at that level from now on, they have something very special on their hands because that was a phenomenal episode that avoided a lot of the, the and, but you know what? Every Star Trek show has growing pains. The, the, really, except the original series. I think the original yeah, series uh, emerged uh, fully under, formed. That's the yeah, understatement but, of the millennium. Sure. Uh, but yeah, next holy gen. Boy. Yeah. Whoa. Yeah. Next gen had, ro- okay. you know, so, okay. so it has growing pains. The, the, I think the problem living in the streaming world is that you get growing pains. You, if you get growing pains and it takes you 20 episodes to figure it out, that's three seasons, you know, and, and it takes you five years to get there. And I, that's a little different than the old, old days of TV where you could figure out those problems in the first or year and a half or so. But uh, I do love how respectful they are to the animated show, because to me, the animated show is a fourth season. It's the fourth season of Star Trek. There's no separation, but it's just season four. Right. And what about you, Mary Jo? Lower Decks? Yeah, I agree with Fred that it, they have gotten stronger and stronger the whole second season, culminating in that finale, which, you know, is a cliffhanger. No spoilers, but yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to season three. Yeah, me, it's, it's my favorite track since uh, 09, uh, without a doubt. And it's, it's creeping up there. Like, I could even see it catching up with Next Gen. But anyway, Fred... We appreciate you doing our show so much. I love doing it. Is there anything you want to plug? Is there anything you want people to to look yeah. at or buy or something like that? Nothing to buy, but uh, it's free. I finally, after years of thinking about it, started my own website. Wait a minute, Fred. Now I'm starting to think, wait, I was about to say, now I'm starting to think you're not an operator, <laughs> but I think I see what you did and you are an operator. You got six books. Yeah. And you did like a little mind trick. You're like, don't buy those books, but buy those books. You don't know, please buy the books, but most of them are out of the first four out of print. Oh, you can buy them. Does anybody know a publisher? Uh, yeah, Uh, I do, but it's not helping me. Well, Uh, Fred, what's a book in print that you want people to know and buy? The two most recent ones one is The Sound of Music Family Legacy which is uh, the seven actors who portrayed the Von Trapp children in the movie wanted to do a book about their experience of making The Sound of Music, and they asked me to write it, and so there's that. And then the other one is a 50-year history of the Jackson Five, and again, the family, three of the brothers made a book deal, and they asked me to write the book, so it's called The Jackson's Legacy. And it's, you know, if you love their music, it's a beautiful book. And the art director is responsible for that, not me. But there's, it's like over a thousand photographs from childhood to today. Uh, so those, but my, my website's fredbronson.com. And there are photos of me on the Star Trek set of Menage a Troy and me in the first Star Trek movie in the motion picture uh, at a rap party with Susan and Jean. So there's some Star Trek and then uh, a lot of my billboard articles, including an interview with Rod Roddenberry. Uh, So fredbronson.com. But Fred's like, this is the worst plug I've ever had. You asked me to plug it. I bring up my website. You interrupt me. So go to. Maybe I'll I'll get another 50 cents. It's okay. Well, you're going to get a call from a guy named Rich Myrick. That's the black and white picture above you. So you may like that call. But okay. anyway, uh, yeah, everybody's going to be excited. I came up, I didn't do it last episode because I didn't think about it. But I have the catchphrase to end all of our episodes. Is everybody ready? Ready. ready. Make it so. Oh, I'm sorry. That could be yours, John. Maybe we all should have one. 
We'll go round robin. Fred, how do you want to close this? What's your closing line? Uh, I swear I'm not an operator. John? Make it so. Mary Jo? Oh my gosh, I'm not clever. May Watch more. No. May the force be with you. No, 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 no. no. Okay. You can't say that on a Star oh, Trek sorry. show. Watch more Star Trek. I'm sorry. That's so bland. No, that's good. That's good. <laughs> it's to the point. All right, here's our closing line. I'm going to end every episode on this. I'm so happy I thought of this. All drive systems are standing by. That's the second most obscure line from Star Trek One after I'm taking the center seat. So, and I screwed it up. So here's how we really do it. Everybody who listened, thank you for listening. Fred, thank you so much for doing this. This was awesome. I, uh -huh. I learned so much. You're an operator, but that's okay. <laughs> so am I. Tenudos, you guys are geniuses. And as I always say for the first time, all drive systems are standing by. The Center Seat After Show is an Nacelle cast original and produced by Brian Volk Weiss, Mary Jo Tenuto, John Tenuto, Brian Adams, Matt Gravitsky, and Richard Myrick. Thank you for listening. Uh, John, Mary Jo, it's great to be on this with you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, we enjoyed really... talking with you and listening to your stories. Loved it. Thank you. I got a million more. So the game. Oh my God. You want to know what I wanted to call it? What? Tell us. I I went in. I I pitched this title, "Advanced to Boardwalk." Awesome. That's a better. Pillar, that's a better title. It's a way better title. Michael Pillar said, "We can't. Parker Brothers will sue us." And I said. No, they'll be thrilled, but they yeah. never even asked. So, oh. yeah. What a shame. I, by the way, that's our new closing line Advance to Boardwalk.